Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Whitmix's webinar, Effective Bite Splints with Dr. Alain Obey. Uh, my name is Bernie Jaroslow. I'm the marketing manager for Whitmix, and, and I'll be facilitating the webinar this morning. So I'd like to begin with a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, if you'll find in the corner of your screen, you'll have a questions box. Well, we certainly uh, welcome, you're welcome to, to type any questions you like Dr. Obey to answer. Uh, he'll be doing that at the end of the presentation. So feel free to type in any questions you have and we'll take care of answering those at the end. Uh, next, the webinar is approved for one hour of CE credit toward recertification. So you will receive an email either tomorrow or the day after that'll explain how to obtain your credit. It does involve a very simple true and false test. So listen up. Uh, and uh, and we'll, you'll answer those questions and we'll be sending you those certif certifications. Um, uh, lastly, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we usually it's up within 24 to 48 hours and it's either, it's both up on the Whitmix website in the webinar section uh, or you'll find it in on YouTube in the, the Whitmix YouTube uh, library. Okay, uh, this morning I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Alain Obey. Um, Dr. Obey graduated from the University of Montreal uh, dental faculty in 1984. He immediately underwent residency program with special emphasis on full mouth prosthodontics and orthonath orthonathic uh, surgery. Uh, he continued on with a full curriculum at the Dawson Center and followed his complete program on TMJ pathology. In 2008, he founded the Canadian Occlusion Institute dedicated to teaching TMJ pathologies from a medical or orthopedic standpoint, and diagnosis and treatment of occlusally related problems. Dr. Obey maintains a full-time uh, practice, a referral practice dedicated exclusively to TMJ and occlusal problems and continues to teach and lecture extensively. Dr. Obey, uh, I'm all set here. If you're ready, let's, let's talk about effective bite splints. All right, thank you, Bernie. Thank you very much. Uh, well, and thank you, Whitmix, for this great opportunity. I uh, always appreciate things we might do together. Um, first, we'll start off with the uh, habitual disclaimers. Uh, participants should be made aware of potential risk of using limited knowledge when incorporating new techniques into their practice. And I do not have any commercial uh, interest that may conflict what I'm going to say today. When I, if I talk about a product, it's absolutely because I use it and love it, not because I'm paid to say anything about it. All right, um, so let's start off with, well, the eyes can't see what the brain doesn't know. So one of the goals I have for today is to show things that, um, that people don't usually see in the way I'm going to present them. And uh, you know, dentists are used to looking at mouths and people in the labs are used to looking at teeth and you see wear and tear in the mouth and on the models, uh, but you don't always understand exactly where all that wear and tear comes from or why it's there. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit to start off because it's important for me at least to understand where uh, all of this comes from to understand the importance of using proper bite splints and why the way I'm going to teach to do them is so important too. So today, what destroys more dental structure? Is it wear or is it decay? Well, most practitioners today answer that question with, well, it's wear. But seriously, what have we been trained for? We've been trained to recognize decay, periodontal disease, and we've been trained to tell patients that they grind their teeth, but that's not very effective because they always answer back that they don't. Uh, and they, it, it's, it's a sort of garage door closing type of conversation where you do not open up a, a conversation with your patients. Um, so basically, the main problem today is not decay anymore in adult patients. It's wear and tear from excessive forces. So we should learn about that, where it comes from, and how to prevent more and to treat it as young as possible to be able to 
preserve the mouth for the longest period of time possible. What I'm going to teach is also helpful in preserving the restorations we do. Uh, wh whatever type of restoration we do, we want that to last a long time for the patient and we want the mouth to last a long time. So we want to prevent further degradation of the mouth and of what we do in that mouth. So I'm basically saying that we should sort of, you know, instead of opening a mouth, when, when a patient, when we walk into the operatory and the patient opens the mouth, instead of looking for decay as the first thing we typically do, we should be looking at signs of wear and tear. And we should understand where that wear and tear comes from. And that way we can have a better conversation with the patient on what it's all about. So this sort of brought my practice a number of years ago to, to a different level, uh, uh, a new level, a different level. And it made me see things in an absolutely different way. And my conversations with the patient completely changed. I used to do like everyone, look at the look at the gay and look at broken down things and then look at the, 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 the periodontium and then maybe talk a little bit about premature aging and but that, but that was sort of a secondary subject. When it became the primary subject of the conversation, the conversations went a lot longer and the amount of work I started doing in mouths just quadrupled. It was it, it was incredible. So I think the practices today should be reoriented towards more looking at why things are breaking down instead of just fixing what's broken. So it's more of a preventive approach. And if we're not in the preventive time, if a patient's later on in life and things are broken down, well, whatever we do, we want that to last. So understanding why things break down, what's at the origin of all of this, helps to understand how we should rebuild the mouth or protect the mouth with an effective bite splint. And also it helps with the conversation with the patient so that the patient gets a better understanding. And for me, my own understanding has brought better understanding in the patient's mind because I could just explain things better and it made it clear for the patient. And as things got clear for the patient, well, the patient wanted more care and more complete and comprehensive care. So who do, do, who do we make bite splints for? Well, basically people that have signs of premature aging or excessive forces that apply in their mouth on the dental aspect and the periodontal aspect, or people that have tension in their muscles or discomfort or pain, or joint dysfunction, discomfort or pain. Uh, now, uh, the, the splint I'm going to talk about today is, is actually, um, again, I've been doing this for, I've been treating these problems for over 25, 25 years, and I've tried a number of splints, like I, I've tried everything I could find. And the splint I'm talking about today is um, the one that yields the highest success rate. So I've tried and tried and tried tons of things. A number of years ago, I used to tr I used to teach actually 20 different types of splints. And now I'm down to about three or four that I regularly use. But one of them stands out as my first line of approach. And it's effective in over 95% of cases. So this has really been like you, you can do a lot of different splints. If you do them well, you can get about a 70, 75% success rate, which is pretty high already. But when you tweak your splint a little bit and you just do it a little in a different way, a little bit of a different way, you can actually push that success rate up to about 95% and having your patients actually wear them for real and be really comfortable. It's actually amazing the number of splints that, uh, again, I, as you said, Bernie, I have a referral practice. And it's really amazing the number of splints that patients walk in with that all I need to do is readjust them a little bit. It takes me about 15 minutes. And uh, patients just say, wow, this is like a totally new splint. This is comfortable. And it becomes effective. And it's all in the way it's adjusted. Now, I'm going to show a little video here. And I'm just going to change the way the screen is presented because I want to be able to control this. 
Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on at the back part in the foundation, in the, in the joint. Um, I know when people speak of joint, typically uh, the, the, the ears close and people don't really want to hear anything about it. But hang on, uh, I'll try and make it really simple and much easier to understand. Okay. So basically, what we're looking at on the screen is, of course, a skeleton seen from the side. And right in the middle there, you have the joint and you have the condyle with the disc on. Now, there's studies that have come out, and actually they've been out for almost 20 years, that actually tell us that the disc is not on in most patients. Actually, one of the first studies that came out was from University of Alberta. Um, where they studied, actually the orthodontist there was tired of being accused of creating joint problems in adolescents once they'd finished their ortho with them. So he, he, he teamed up with his radiologist and he said, couldn't we just find out if they had problems before we start? So they did that and the results were astonishing because at age 15, almost 90% of girls have at least one side with a displaced disc and about 80% of boys. And that comes from a fragility we have, and it's an anthrop anthropological thing that's been happening. It's a fragility we've been having for the past 200 years. And what goes on is that when we're kids, we fall, we play, and which is normal. But what's different nowadays compared to 200 years ago and before that, is that now the ligaments that hold the disc in place are much more fragile and we actually end up displacing our discs with absolutely anecdotal small little trauma to the chin. We don't need to fall from the second story to, and, and flat on your chin for you to get that disc out of place. You, you can just be running around, you just fall and you hit yourself on the, 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 the the living room table or whatever, you fall on your chin, you were walking upstairs, you hit yourself. It doesn't take much of a trauma. I don't even call it trauma anymore. I call it a life event. And I have four children and all uh, three of them have bilaterally displaced discs and one of them has one on one side. So basically this is becoming the new norm, but this new norm is a problem. Now let me show you what happens when that disc displaces. And so basically, when the disc slips forward, the condyle comes up. So if you look at that, at the condylar or at the articular level, you'll see what's happening. But let me put it back into place. And now I want you to look at the tooth level. Come and look here. I hope you can see my cursor on the screen. If you don't, look at the first molar. Just look at the first molar, the, the relationship between the upper and lower first molars. And let me just move that disc out of place while you're looking at the first molars. So out comes the disc and look at that lower molar being pulled back and this patient becoming slightly class two-ish and actually creating interferences in his mouth. Now in this relatively short lecture, I'm not gonna to go too much into the details, uh, but basically, when the disc slips forward, the patient becomes a little bit more class two, and there's more post, there's a posteriorization of the bite. And because the, because the mandible is a class three lever, you're actually augmenting the force on the teeth and on the joint. And the problem with that is that you've just augmented the force on a joint that has lost its cartilage protection. So what happens is that patients, well, young patients, because the disc is out and there's too much pressure on the joint, their condyles stay short and their mandibles stay short. And this is one of the causes of class twos developing and of patients not being able to catch up with their growth and staying with the retrognathic mandible. There are other reasons too, and I, and I won't go into that today, but this is definitely one of the reasons. And it's been published and there's a great book out, and we'll look at that book a little later on, 
but um, a great book out came by, uh, by a radiologist um, in uh, California, uh, David Hatcher and his partner, Daniel Tamimi. And uh, it's an 850 page book on joint pathology. And this, that, that book explained this, explains this like really into all the details. But let's just accept that for now, that discs now displace and the majority of our adult patients have displaced discs. Because the discs are displaced, the bites are off. We don't have perfect bites anymore, and this is part of the reason. So let's move out of this and move to the next slide, and we will just go a little bit further down the line. Now, to illustrate what I just said, I'm going to bring you into a number of cases. So we're going to be looking at mouths and looking at these mouths, you're going to sort of see what I just talked about. Well, I'll illustrate what I just talked about. So here we have two panoramic images. On the upper is a 94 year old lady. On the bottom is a 97 year old man. Now on the upper, you can, anyone that can look at the panoramic image and look around the condyles, you'll see that there's almost no condyles left. This lady had a short mandible all her life. It started with a displaced disc. And after that, because the disc was out of place and because the bite was more posterior and that augments the force, her condyles became osteoarthritic and they eventually slowly melted away. As that happened, her bite changed. The bite progressed and the bite changed and the forces were applied differently all the time. And that would stimulate her to clench and eventually her whole bite collapsed. So if you look at that, you can ask the question, did the collapsing bite create the poor joints and the joint degradation? or did the joint degradation create the collapsing bite? Well, it's not either or, it's both. It's bi-directional. If you get a bad joint, you're gonna be getting a bad bite automatically. If you have a bad bite, that bad bite, and it's a, it's a mechanical principle, we've known this since Archimedes 2000 years ago, if you have an off bite, you're gonna have more force on that condyle. And if that condyle is not protected with the disc, well, you're just gonna have, well, you can have, not always, but oftentimes you'll have osteoarthritic damage into that condyle. So what's actually happening is you're getting the whole system that's wearing much quicker than it should, and it's just collapsing and the teeth are breaking down, the periodontion is breaking down, the joint's breaking down with or without pain. And mind you, a lot of people think that a joint is bad only when it has pain. Well, is a tooth bad only when it has pain? Or gums bad only when they have pain? Is it, what, let's go for a big example. Is cancer bad only when it becomes painful? No, pain is an alarm. When something becomes painful, it's because it's been going on for too long. So, Let's look at the bottom image. If you look at the bottom image, you can see great condyles. You can see a bite that's still pretty straight. Well, of course, these teeth have, have, are leaning forward a little bit, but it's because there's a missing molar there. But if you look at the front part, this is held up. So when the foundation in the back holds up, the teeth hold up. I mean, this man was born in 1920. I mean, if I still have him out that good when I'm 97, I'll be pretty happy. Um, so basically, if the foundation holds, the bite holds. If the bite holds, the foundation holds. It goes together and it's bidirectional. So let's look at images in more, de in more detail so we can understand that. If you look here, you've got a, a mouth where the palate's thin and you're crossbite on both sides. But if you look at the condyles, both of them are small. And what happened here? Well, to, uh, many things happened. 
But one of the things is that the discs were displaced when that person was young, the condyles didn't grow, the bite became off, that person was a mouth breather, so the palate stayed small. Actually, there, there was no lateral or anterior posterior um, growth. There was not, pro not proper growth of the mandible and not proper growth of the max growth of the maxilla. So basically, her bite is completely off. And what do you think is happening? Everything's breaking down. The periodontium is breaking down. The teeth are wearing. They're cracking. They're breaking. And it's just havoc in this mouth because forces are not applied like nature had planned them to be. Let's look at the next case. By the way, that, that previous image where the mouth where the mouth is crooked and you can sort of superimpose that on the panoramic image, I like to see mouths that way. That's how I look into a mouth. I look at the teeth and I can already imagine what's going on within the joints. I'm not 100% right all the time, but you know, pretty often problem is there too. So let's look at this face. Look at the chin. You can see the chin is crooked. If you look closely, you'll see that the ramus on her left side is shorter than the ramus on her right side. And you can really appreciate that here on the side image. Now, what her teeth look like? Now, this bottom picture isn't crooked. It's not the picture that's crooked. It's the canting. It's a severe canting of the bite, of the occlusal plane. And which side is short? Left side. Which molars are missing? The two upper left molars. This lady came in saying, I, 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 well, before I get implants, my dentist told me to come to you. I said, well, OK, let me have a look. And if you look at the back here, you'll see two missing molars. But we can, what you can also notice is that there's absolutely no decay from bicusp, second bicuspid to second bicuspid, top and bottom. This lady does not have decay as a problem. She has small restorations on the upper molars on the right. She has no molars on the left. Well, what happened in her case, and we'll look at the panorex right away. Now, you can, you can appreciate the canting of the bite just looking at the panoramic image. These molars are much higher than these. Now, the condyle here is short and stubby. And if you look at the coronoid process up here, it's much higher than the condyle. And that's not supposed to be that way. It should be at least, like on this side, equal, but ideally, Normal growth of the condyle should bring it up just a little bit higher than the coronoid process. So what's going on? Well, she obviously lost her disc here. I can confirm because we have an MRI. But she lost her disc here. The condyle didn't grow completely. That gave her a side shift to her left side. Let's go back to the tooth image, and you can appreciate how the midline is way out to the left. That's because her, and that's not a tooth shift. That's a mandibular shift. The whole mandible is shifted all the way out to her, to her left side. So back to the panoramic image. And here we can appreciate why that happened. So the foundation did not grow and has osteoarthritic damage and shortened with time. As that condyle shortened, where do you think the pressure went? Where was the bite force applied? Well, right there. And so those two molars had small restorations when she was young. There were fractures around them. They were replaced and replaced and eventually replaced with crowns. And the excessive pressure on the crowns led to pain. So she had endo on both of them. And eventually, she had new uh, post and cores and new crowns. And the pressure just kept going back onto those teeth because the condyle kept shrinking. And eventually, she had root fractures. And all of this on about a 30-year period of time. So eventually, her teeth were lost. 
Now she wants them replaced and she wants implants. Now who wants to put two great implants into a socket where there's excessive force on it? Nobody wants to do that. That's why she was sent to me. So we made a perfect splint, stabilized the, the situation, equilibrated her bite, and then now we sent her back to get the implants done because the degradation has stopped because we've controlled her bite force. Now, I say stopped, it's relatively stopped. We slowed it down. That kind of is still gonna melt slowly. So I'm gonna recommend to the person that's gonna restore those implants to use either composite resin crowns or high alloy gold, high gold content crowns so that there will be adaptation of the crowns to the shrinking condyle with time. And I'm gonna recommend to that restorative dentist also to make sure her bite splint stays adjusted and that her bite stays adjusted. And I want him to actually check her bite at least every six months when she comes in and do whatever adjustment is needed to maintain proper distribution of the forces all around the mouth and on her bite splint. And because the forces are well distributed, well, there's less force on each tooth and there's less force on the condyle. So everything will um, hold up a lot better because just because the forces are controlled, things are distributed properly, and we're just taking control of the breaking down of the mouth and we're preventing further degradation of the mouth. So again, this is the type of mental image I would like people to have when they see a mouth where there's signs of wear and tear, always go have a look at your panoramic image. And when you do, look at those teeth on the panorex and imagine the teeth and superimpose. When you go to the mouth, imagine the condyles. When you go to the panoramic image, imagine the teeth there too. So you'll develop this ability to look at both and to superimpose both. And you'll develop the ability to understand what's going on in the foundation by looking at the mouth. Now, there it is. Okay. Um, this case is uh, Lady 2, and you can, she see, you can see she's pretty retrognathic. She had rheumatoid arthritis, and her hands were, uh, she had these little stents around her fingers to hold them in place because her fingers were all crooked. But look at her bite. I mean, this is horrendous. And she came saying, Dr. Obey, you have to stop my, my condyles, my jaw from, well, she actually said condyles because she, 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 knew the, she knew the word. You have to stop my condyles from melting because my chin is just going back and back. And because of my osteoarthritic problem, I can't be operated to have it brought forward again because I have so much osteoarthritic damage in my neck that if they intubate me, they can break my neck. So the only reason I'm going to get intubated is if I have a life-threatening issue. So um, I said, well, uh, I'll try. I'll do my best. And I did the splint. And I'll explain, I'll explain a little later on how I do the splint, so that because that's, of course, why we're here today. But um, I made the splint, and we were really blessed. This one, we were really, really blessed. It stopped the degradation stopped and it's been like five years I've treated her and things have been totally stable since. And all I did was make a bite splint that spread the forces around correctly. So can you imagine in her mouth here where all the forces are applied? Last tooth in the back and joint. So 100% of the force applied from her jaw muscles went to the back teeth the, back, the, the furthest back teeth and to the joints. And that was excessive. If you think about orthopedics, you'll notice that it's an orthopedic principle that if you take just a little bit of pressure off of an osteoarthritic, osteoarthritic joint, that joint may adapt. And that, that's, that information is, is very public. It's on the Mayo Clinic site. If you, if you type up Mayo Clinic and you go to osteoarthritis, uh, you'll have home care. You have a section called home care. And in that home care, it says, you know, 
if you if you're heavy lose a little bit of weight just that little difference maybe 10 15 pounds can make a difference on the osteoarthritic progression of whatever joint knee or hip whatever problem you have a little difference can make a, a little difference in pressure can make a big difference in the joint's capacity to adapt and in this case we were lucky blessed i should say and it adapted so she stopped degrading and basically she's happy now because things are stable and her bite's good and we equilibrated her bite and she's happy so that was the main issue um let me go to let me go to this one i know time's going by and i want to get to the nitty-gritty at the end if again if you look at this face now it's distorted this lady is long-faced in the front but she's very short ramus her angle of the mandible is her ang the plane angle is extremely high the angle here is extremely open and how do you think she is in the front well if you guess she was open by well you're right because that's what it is she's fully open but why is that and this is not a tongue thrust problem her tongue's small it's way in the back this is not a tongue problem but where, so where does this come from well let's look at the panoramic image no condyles left she's 47 47 and the condyles are shut and her bite is off her bite is strictly on her back teeth where's the pressure back teeth and condyles unprotected condyles severely osteoarthritic you think that's going to get better on itself no way she walked in with this splint and i cannot condemn the dentist that made this splint this splint was made the way that dentist was taught you know make something to protect the teeth and try something and that's how most dentists think because that's how we're educated and that's how i was educated and I made splints like this before I learned how to do them right. So where's the pressure on this splint? Way down in the back. So is this helping? Well, partially it's helping the teeth not to get worn more, but is it doing anything to help that joint stabilize? Sorry, but no. So if we want to stabilize that joint, we have to make a splint that's going to come and touch the front teeth too and we're going to have to distribute the forces in a different way than just having the pressure all the way in the back uh, for people that may know about mri here's the mri of her and most most dentists are not familiar with mri and that's a pity because we should because they're fantastic images for the joint and well, well, basically, okay, this is the meatus of the ear, the ear canal. And here's the deep part of the fossa, and this is what's left of her condyle. And if it doesn't look like a condyle, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is just the neck of the condyle. There's no condyle. The condyle should be a ball on a tee, a golf ball on a tee. And here, I mean, there's only a tee at, the, at, at ground level. That tee was broken off. I mean, Tiger really hit that one. And on the other side, again, you can see just a little bit of a shape of a condyle, but it's very small and severely osteoarthritic. All right, let's go to the next patient. Um, this guy is called Dennis, and Dennis is a smiley guy. He's happy. I mean, his life is happy. Everything in life is good. So, I mean, life's good is Dennis. So this guy's really great. And it, it shows in his mouth. I mean, if you look at his teeth, I mean, he, he walks around with no front teeth. He doesn't care. He's happy. But at one point, he decided he wanted his teeth restored. He wanted new front teeth. And the dentist said, Dr. Baker, would you, would you please check his joints? I think they're a little bit worn. So look at the panoramic image. I mean, what kind of eyes? They're totally flat, severely osteoarthritic. And that goes with the wear on the teeth. Now. Let's look at the teeth from an occlusal view. Look at these molars. The, 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 the distal ridge 
of the sevens, or the, well, in Canada we call them sevens, so they're the, the, the second molars. Um, the distal ridge of the second molars is worn down to the gum line. Now, can anybody listening do that? Can anybody listening actually rub the distal ridge of their upper second molar with their lower second molars? If you can, please send me your Panorex. I mean, you're not supposed to be able to bring your mandible that far back. Your lower seven is supposed to be in front of your upper seven. You're not supposed to be able to reach that ridge. The only way you're going to reach that ridge to wear it is if your condyles are completely shot and your mandible is way back in retrognathic and so that your, your, your back teeth are just a full tooth too far back. So where's the pressure in this mouth? Well, I guess it's pretty obvious, way in the back. Is that helping his joints? No. Is that helping his teeth? No. Is the joint killing the teeth? Yes. Is the teeth killing the joint? Are the teeth killing the joint? Yes. It's bilateral, it's bi-directional. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And let me show you a case that was restored. Um, patient came in like this, and this was restored by a friend of mine before he learned about occlusion. So um, this was the Panorex post-restoration, and these are the restorations. The patient wanted really white teeth, and they didn't want any bridges anymore. He wanted implants, so that was all done. But after about a year, it started breaking down. And when the condyles were seated, that was his bite only pressure on the two last teeth here and this was an implant so that implant was lost actually this is the new panoramic image you can see everything that was lost but one of the reasons that this patient if you can if you notice this condyle is super small and you can actually notice these little things here these are screws to fix a suborbital fracture this patient had a blow young when he was young and that created a disc displacement, and that condyle just shrunk from osteoarthritic damage, and that's why his bite is completely off. The case was restorated, was restored, sorry, was restored in the habitual bite, not in the seated condylar position. And when you don't rely on the seated condylar position, and you rely on the patient's habitual bite, well, when that patient chews and moves and swallows, the bite changes because that condyle is, becomes seated by the muscle pressure. And so you end up with actually a patient chewing just on the last tooth of the back like that, or when he swallows, those teeth hit hard, or at night when he grinds, that's where he's grinding because that's where the condyles bring the mandible. So we should treat to seated condylar position in most cases, uh, most, most cases, and that's been scientifically demonstrated. For those of you who know about Jeff Okison, uh, he's written, he's, 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 at, he's at his eighth edition of his book on temporal mandibular uh, problems and occlusion, and it's now scientifically proven that and, I, and be careful of what I'm going to say. I, I want you to hear what I said, but I don't want you to interpret more than what I said. So what I'm saying is that when the bite is perfected to seated condylar position, so maximum intercrispation corresponds to the seated condylar position, that's when you get the best force distribution. That translates to, that's when each part of the masticatory system gets the least possible amount of pressure. And mark my words that were chosen. I'm going to repeat that. So when you restore a bite, or when you accrual a bite, or when you make a bite splint, they should always be made to the seated condylar position and then maximum, maximum intercuspation should correspond 
to the seated condylar position because when things are planned and done that way, that is how you minimize the force, the applied force on every element of the system. And I'm talking about the joints, the muscles, the periodontium, and the teeth. So mechanically, that is the best bite. Now, there are other reasons, and I'm go not going into that today, but there are a couple a small percentage of people that need something different, but that, that, that comes with a lot of education and a lot of understanding how the joint functions. But as, as a regular day-to-day -day practice, giving a patient a splint that's made to seated condylar position and all the teeth contact equally from that position and giving them canine guidance in the front and incisal guidance going forward, you're going to give them the best splint to protect the whole system. Mechanically, that has been proven to be the best splint. Now, does it cure everything? No, it doesn't. Some people walk in, there's too much damage in their joint, or they're, they're hypertense, or they, they, they can't calm down. And, and so be careful, a splint doesn't take care of everything but it does take care of the mechanics. It does help the muscles to work better in, in pairs and in coordinated pairs. It does help um, the, 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 the joints to have less pressure and it does help the teeth to have less pressure. So the, a, a good, a well-made splint always helps. Does it cure everything? No, not always, because sometimes the problem the patient walks in is just too great. Okay, we'll have to, I have time for one more case or maybe two before we get to the conclusion. Now, this lady, her bite is slightly off, um, looks like a normal mouth. Condyle is really short on one side. And what's funny is you can look at the roots of the tooth. They're all angled towards the short condyle. That's, it's not an absolute law, but that's something you should always look at, looking at the panoramic image. If the roots are pointing all in the same direction, you can pretty much expect the condyle they're pointing to as being the short and problematic condyle. Now, what I wanted to illustrate with this case is that, again, she's moved over to her left side. Now, where's the, where's the bite force? on the back teeth and these three teeth these three molars are all mobile they have a, well i don't know how you name it but we call this a, a number three mobility so all three molars are hypermobile and she has no tartar it's not a periodontal problem well it's a periodontal problem but that comes from bite force and not from infection from bacteria and presence of tartar. So she had a perfect hygiene and her molars were totally mobile strictly because there was excessive bite force in her mouth on those back teeth. So we made a splint for her and the teeth solidified and then everything was good for her. We equilibrated her bite and then things were good for her. Now let's talk about implants for a sec and the importance of proper bite adjustment on implants. This patient was losing her teeth because of periodontal problems, but the dentist didn't know why these periodontal problems were happening. So the teeth were extracted, implants were placed, confirmed, and then they were loaded. But the restoring dentist here wanted to protect that upper bridge that was, and, and I can understand why. If you look at this, you can understand why the dentist wanted to protect the bridge. So where did the dentist put all the bite force? Back here. So look at these very well integrated implants. That's October, 2014. A year and a half later, April, 2016, the implants are shut. They're starting to lose bone all around. Excessive bite force in this case created the problem. One could argue that it was infection. In this specific case, it wasn't. Hygiene was perfect and it was not infection. 
I can confirm that. I saw the case. Now, the bite force was all on the back teeth. There was too much bite force and it shot the implants. We made a splint for the patient and she eventually had the implants replaced. And now the bite, the new bite is, it's not, the case hasn't been redone yet, but it's going to be redone in a more proper manner with a bite splint every night to protect the lower teeth, the lower implants and the upper bridge. Um, a quick little one, this case is, a, she's a 27 year old physician. She came in with headaches and basically uh, look at her midline, beautiful teeth, you know, lovely young woman, beautiful teeth, but look at the midline, totally out to the right side. So where was the bite force? On her right side. Where were her headaches? Which muscles were hyperactive and overreacting? The right side. What I do? A good bite splint, calm things down, equilibrated her bite, now she's good. Just to illustrate, look at her chin. You think she has great big condyles or small little ones? She's 16 on this picture. And this was 2011, 2012. Look at the bite opening. This is, this is the orthodontist sending me the pictures. 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014. So as the bite started opening in the, in the first couple of years, the orthodontist said to the patient, well, you're comfortable, you're okay, yeah, well, the front teeth are not touching, you can eat, you can chew, yeah, you're comfortable, okay, why don't you stay that way? We'll watch this. Well, he watched it until it crumbled. And look at her mouth now. So then he decided to send her to me. So the panoramic image shows there's no condyles left. And this is idiopathic kind of resorption. And we know now that idiopathic condyle resorption only happens in cases with discs that are totally in front and non-reducing. So there's no recapture of the disc upon opening of the mouth, no clicking sound. So this girl, because the disc is totally in front and there's no reduction, there's things going on that create a situation within the joint that that joint just decided to degrade both joints decided to degrade really fast. And at 17 years old, she, her mouth is totally open up in the front. And now where's the bite force? On the back teeth. So she has pain in her muscles, she has headaches, joint pain, and her joints are degrading. So this ended up being a surgical case. I did the bite splint until things calmed down and stabilized, but then uh, I mean, I couldn't just equilibrate her mouth, so I sent her back to the surgeon, and she's going to have orthodontics again and orthognathic surgery and possibly total joint replacement with, with prostheses. Um, time will tell. And let's just show one last case before we get to the conclusion, and I want to show a little eight-year-old girl. Um, look at her teeth. And you will see that already she's eight. <clears throat> and look at that lower midline, totally shifted out to the right. And this is not a tooth shift. Again, this is a mandibular shift. And what's going on, it's hard to appreciate on the panorex because you can barely see that this condyle is a little bit flatter than this one, it's rounder. But again, if you look at the MRI or if we had a 3D scan, we could tell. So. Her left condyle is nice and round. And well, I don't know if you can see the disc, if you guys can appreciate the disc, but the disc is this sort of S-shaped thing here. So that's the disc. So it's between the condyle and the deep part of the fossa. And on the other side, you can see the condyle is flat and angled. And this, the, the disc is, it looks like a UFO over here. Um, looks like a flying saucer. Um, her condyle has totally stopped growing because that disc is totally out of place and non-reducing. And because the disc is non-reducing, and again, I'm not going to go into the details of that and how it all happens. We don't have the time this morning, but 
because the disc is out of place and not reducing, her condyle stopped growing. So her mouth is crooked. So in her case, we're not doing a bite splint, of course, she's way too young for that. But um, she's looking at, of course, orthodontics and orthognathic surgery and possible disc repositioning. Now, if she grows up and she's not taken care of properly, she's going to end up being an adult patient with more pressure on one side than the other, her bite totally off, wear and tear. And I showed, I showed you these cases in this order, old to young, so that you could appreciate the effects and then eventually understanding where it all starts from. So, uh, sorry. so now we understand that all of these bites that are off have, well, not all of them, but the ones I showed and a lot of them have an origin in poor growing condyles because the discs are displaced. Now, uh, these are four relatively recent books that are important to read because things have changed. In this last decade, things about the temporomandibular joint have changed a lot. I mean, total paradigm shift. I mean, we went from one end to the other end of the spectrum. Occlusion is a totally new science uh, in these days, in the 2020s, than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we were lost. Now we know a lot more. We don't know it all yet. And that's, I would never say that because we still have a lot to learn. But we know a lot more and we understand a lot more of why things happen, how things happen, why things happen. So uh, I won't go through the details of the books because we're, we're closing in on the time here. Uh, it's like, yeah, what, what, yeah, eight to 12. So anyways, have a look at these books and they're just fantastic books and they bring our knowledge a lot further down the line than we were 10 years ago. Um, so let's go into the four effects I want of a bite splint. What do I want in a bite splint? So basically, let's go back to the principles of a bite splint. You should always take your bite into a seated kind of a position. Now, I know uh, Bernie told me there was a lot of labs out there today. And in where I'm from, I presented to the lab technicians a couple of times, to their association a couple of times. And they all tell me, yeah, when a dentist sends a bite in, most of the time we just throw into the garbage can because we just put the teeth together and it's easier that way and it's more precise. Well, I said, if you do that with mine, I'm not gonna be very happy um, because I don't let the patient close in their habitual bite when I take a bite. I want those condyles seated. And when you look at the mounted casts, you might think that that's totally off and why on earth does he want us to make a, a night guard in that position? Well, call me if that happens. I want that. I want the, the mandible to be in the seated position because mechanically that's how I'm going to be able to make a bite splint that's going to distribute the forces properly and get the least pressure on the joint, the teeth, periodontium and have those muscles work the less. So please use the bites that are made in a seated condylar position because that's the only way we're going, we're going to be able to make a splint that's going to be truly effective for the patient. Now, again, the principles are simple, seated condylar position for the bite, and then the teeth should all touch equally, including the front ones, including the canines and incisors. Typically, personally, I like to leave just a little bit more pressure on the canines than the other teeth. I want those canines to work. They're the, they're the strongest teeth in the mouth, and I want them to work. So personally, I, I, I lighten up the contacts on all the other teeth. I keep the canines just a tad stronger. And I want lateral guidance on those canines and incisal protrusion on the incisors, of course. And it's that simple. I mean, there's no, there's no secret. I mean, it's just basic. 
the trick, the, the, the thing is to use the seated condylar position and make your splint from that position. Now, what effects am I looking for? Well, basically, I'm looking for four effects in the bite splint. Because it's made, when it's made properly, you'll have reduction of the total amount of applied force. You'll distribute whatever force is less in it, whatever force is left in an optimal manner. Um, when you move sideways, if the canine is guiding, you know it's been measured that a lateral movement on the canine versus the second molar, you have exactly 10 times less applied force on the canine than on the second molar. It's incredible. And there's also something called cancellation of muscle antagonism and hyperactivity, but I don't want to go through that right now. It's a little bit complicated um, on a short webinar like this one. So let me bring you to images of what this leads to. And let me show you how truly effective a bite splint can be with absolute proof. So I published an article in December of this year um, about condylar reformation. So the, cort the cortex of the condyle, the condylar head, a lot of patients come in and, then, and, and they have the perforated. The, cond the cortex, the cortical layers of the condyle are perforated from osteoarthritic damage. And early on in this presentation, I said, well, just reducing a little bit of force off that condyle can actually completely change what's happening. The condyle can go from a degrading condyle to an adapting condyle with just a little bit of change. So the article I published was exactly on that. It's MRI images of a series of cases where we showed that with one year of wear of an equilibrated bite splint, like I just talked about, the cortex of the condyle completely adapted and reformed. Condyle didn't grow, it didn't grow back, but the cortical layer, sorry, cortical layer totally reformed. So if we look at this now on this patient in 2014, this is a short little stubby condyle, but you can appreciate that there's no black line here. And the cortical layer is black on the MRI. Um, there's none here. And down here a year later, you can see this black line. And that one's hard to see. So let's look at this one. This one, this black line is here, but it's really, really thin. And if you look a year later, it's thick. And you can see that is healing of the cortical layer of the condyle. Let's go to another one. This one's a little bit easier to see. Now, this is the condyle in a frontal or what we call a coronal view. So this is front to back. We're looking at the condyle from the front perpendicular to its long axis. So this is the outline of the condyle, but you can see it's a little heart shaped. So what is this? This is a hole in the head of the condyle. It's called osteochondritis dissecans. So it's a form of osteoarthritic damage. So there's a hole in the condyle and there is, you can see this little black area underneath this is ischemia in the bone marrow. Now, next image, a year and a half later, you can see total reformation of that cortical layer. And this is the only change in that person's mouth was the bite using a bite splint. The patient was not even equilibrated yet. All we did was distribute the forces during the nighttime so that she stopped clenching and applying excessive pressure on that condyle. And just from that, just from that little change, the force being properly distributed, her condyles healed. So imagine what it did for her muscles. Her muscles calmed down, her headaches calmed down, her neck pain calmed down, just because the bite force went from excessive to tolerable and it permitted the system, it, yeah, it permitted the system to adapt. There's another one here. And in, uh, well, this one's harder to see. It's small. Let me see if I can grow it. Make it. Yeah, there it is. I can blow it up. So again, you can see the condyle has, has a, a pretty poor shape here. Uh, the outline is here and here. You have osteoarthritic damage. And a year later, you can see it's well rounded. This is actually ten months later. It's well rounded and very well adapted. And a last one here where you have the cortical layer that's interrupted from here to here. Like this is cortex, this is cortex, 
This is a hole in the head of a condyle. There's no cortical layer from here to here. And if we move over, you can see that this is completely healed within 14 months. So basically, uh, that's sort of the conclusion of, of what I had to say for today. So basically, an effective bite splint has a positive effect on the way the, the forces are distributed. And that has a positive effect on the biology of the patient. So the muscles work less, and because the muscles work less, the teeth have less pressure, the periodontium has less pressure, the joint has less pressure. So that is preventive measures for the future of the patient, and it's even corrective measures for the condyle. Now, uh, because of my association with bite effects, and there's a, a couple of, um, of animations I use when I, when I work, there's a company called Bite Effects. It's a software company. And uh, I use their animations, and they're really fun people. And they have this COVID special, and I'd like to forward this to you. So if you go to biteeffects.com forward slash COVID-19 and WMs for whip mix, because there's, we've been all working together for a long time. Um, this is a good thing for Dennis. The, the software explains all of what we've talk, talked about today, and uh, they're just great people. So, uh, and again, I am not paid for this. I'm not paid to say this. I use their software with every single patient I treat. It's the only way I have of explaining this in 10 to 15 minutes to the patient so that they understand. So thank you to Doug Brown from BiteFX for giving me permission to use his, um, his software when I teach. Uh, and uh, thank you to Doug for all the work you've been doing across the years to help us out explaining all of this to patients to make it readily available and easy for patients to understand. So uh, Bernie, that's my conclusion for today. And if you have any questions, if you want me to go on about anything, well, I think we're, we're pretty close in time here. So uh, again, thank you. Thank you, uh, great presentation, a lot of, a lot of uh very useful information. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, there's a couple questions. So uh, before we adjourn, let me let me uh, read those to you. Uh, one is, what was the Hatcher book entitled? Oh, Specialty Imaging: The Temporomandibular Joint, published at Elsevier. Okay. The next one looks like it's got a few questions in one. Let me see. It says, please explain further the treatment case of lady left disc displacement isn't equal equilibration alone too much grinding for this case and then it says also what's the goal of the condyle level with the splint adapted centric position no pain will face stay unevent it says after correction so there you go not quite sure um, would you just go, go with that first, the first little bit yeah. you said about lady what? I didn't really get you on that one. Okay, it says, please explain further the treatment case of lady left disc displacement. Must be the lady with the left disc displacement. Yeah. Okay, Isn't yes. Isn't alone too much grinding for this case? No, 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 not at all. That's a misconception. Um, I've equilibrated tons of people with six and seven millimeter slides uh, that I've that that, that have that has consumed less enamel than doing a simple veneer on on, on a central. Um, it, it's it's a it's a strong misconception that when we equilibrate that we're re removing a lot of enamel. Um, it, that's hard to explain without a demonstration. But no, equilibration does not remove that much enamel uh, in, in most, most, most cases. And uh, it, it's amazing, actually. It, it's amazing how little enamel equilibration takes up. Um, and, and in that case, definitely not. Definitely, definitely not. I'm a, I'm a, remember that I'm, I've been talking about prevention and being conservative. Uh, I'm a conservative dentist. I don't full mouth rehab all the patients because they have a joint issue. No, I do not do that. Um, that's not being conservative. Uh, I'm a conservative dentist and I want, I want the teeth to stay as natural and healthy as they can. I don't want to destroy teeth 
doing something. I don't want to create a worse problem. So I, it's extremely rare that I'll say to a patient that I'll have to restore a tooth because it needs to be really moved out of the way. Most of the time, I'll prefer to send the patient to the orthodontist to move the tooth out of the way, and then I can equilibrate using uh, you know, consuming less enamel. So, uh, and is the case going to be stable long term? Well, as stable as we can get it. Uh, listen, um, we age. We all age. Uh, I've aged, I, and when I look around, my friends have aged. And so uh, that's what happens. That's how life is. We all age. But the goal is to age a year at a time. The problem with these patients is that they'll age two and three and four and five years at a, t at a time. So the goal using the bite splint the way I did, way, the way I, I presented, is to reduce the aging to normal aging. So we will age. We will change. But we will do so in a normal way, in the way it was planned to be. Hope that hope that answers the question. Okay, and in the same doctor's uh, question group, it said, and there are other questions that have come in since. But uh, so, what's the goal at the condyle level with the splint? I'm Reducing re the goal is to reduce the pressure off the condyle. That's it. And be, I, again, I want to be careful in what's interpreted from that. It, reducing the reducing the pressure and uh, distracting the condyle are two different things. So reducing the level of pressure is not saying that that condyle is coming down. Condyles do not, it's a mechanical principle. You cannot distract a condyle unless you're, you're using extreme and excessive force. If you're putting a bite splint in the patient's mouth, you're never distracting a condyle. Uh, whatever type of orthotic you're putting in the mouth, you're never distracting a condyle. You can either move the condyle forward along the eminence or you can seat it. Or, or whatever, but you cannot distract a condyle. Um, the way the muscles are made, you, you just can't. So uh, the goal is to reduce the amount of pressure on the whole system, condyle teeth, again, periodontium, and reduce the muscle effort. Okay, uh, next one is, uh, what is your favorite technique to achieve your CR bite? Okay, um, Okay. we can go into the definition of CR here. I do not use the expression CR anymore. Uh, CR in its proper definition uh, means the, that both discs are in place. That is an extremely rare event. Uh, out of the last 2,400 joints I have examined on MRI, I have found less than 2% of discs in place. Um, so 98% of the discs are out of place. So you can talk about what Dawson used to call the adapted centric posture. Uh, we have moved that term now to seated condylar posture, seated condylar position, because the word centric is false. It's when when the when the disc is moved out of place, the condyle is not centered anymore. So we should take the word centered out of there, and um, that's why we we now use seated condylar position as the expression to describe where the muscles naturally, in the absence of interference, bring the condyles when the muscle when the elevator muscles are active and the opening muscles are relaxed meaning that the digastric is relaxed and the lateral pterygoids are relaxed. So when the temporalis, medial pterygoid, and, uh, and masseter, of course, are contracted and fully contracting, they will bring the condyles into a certain position. That position is repeatable, usually stable if the joint's stable, and that is what we call seated condylar position. And I always work to, I, I, I say always, uh, 99% of the time I work to that position. Okay. Um, this oh, next so, one... I forgot to answer the question, sorry. Uh, the question was, how do I make it get there? Well, I, well, there's different techniques. I mean, I studied with Peter Dawson 25 years ago and he used to show us his bimanual manipulation. That was a great technique. Um, sometimes I use a leaf cage. Uh, you can use a luchagia, you can use an NTI, you can use a deprogrammer. There's all sorts of techniques 
to get to the seated condylar position. Uh, if I'm equilibrating, I always use the Pete's bimanual uh, manipulation. I, mean, I love Pete like like a father. I mean, he's he was such a great guy. And he, anyways, so so I mean, we, we became friends with time. And so, anyways, the the bimanual manipulation is one of the best things to happen to dentistry. But that's only one way. But there are other ways too to see the condyle properly. There's there's different ways. And a lot of different institutions will teach proper ways to do it. Um, just find a way that, that, can, that that's convenient for you and uh, just make sure that the condyles are seated when you're taking your bed. Okay. Uh, next is how do you fabricate the bite splints? Do you wax up the models mounted in the articulator? Oh, uh, well, we, we make them different ways. I didn't present that today. We didn't have time, but we're starting to do them fully digitally. We're not yeah. printing models anymore. We're actually uh, taking uh, impressions, uh, digital impressions, and we're creating digital models. And with the software, we're conceiving the splints, and then we're printing them, and then we're going to the mouth with that. That's the that is so, just so great. Within a few hours, we can deliver a splint. Um, if it's lab made, when I still want to have it lab made for certain reasons. Then uh, again, I'll just send in the digital impressions to the lab uh, with the bite taken digitally, and the lab will, my lab will still mount the case. Uh, they will print models, they will mount the case in the in with the with the digital bite, and th th this is just the way we take the bite is just right on. So they come back from the lab, and we have minor, minor, minor adjustments to make. Uh, usually delivering a splint is like five to 10 minutes, no more. When when the bite's right and the impressions are good, I mean, delivering a splint is just a cinch. It's, it's so easy. So It just makes life so simple and they're comfortable. Yeah. Uh, next one might require a little interpretation. Uh, at least it does for me. So let's see what, what you uh, get out of this. It says terminology, seated, Condylar position plus CR bone position, where CO, the letter CO equals MIP question mark, and then right below that the doctor put equals CR. So maybe the CO he meant CR. Okay. So if if that's the case, let me repeat that uh, terminology. I got, I got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah, you yeah, you were clear on that. Thank you, Bernie. Okay. Um, the CO is the point is the occlusion the way the teeth come together when the condyles are seated so yes i want co and mi to be the same now if there's if the disc is out of cr is a condylar position when the discs are in place so if the discs are not in place Theoretically, you should not be using the expression centric relation or CR. CR should be limited to when the discs are fully in place. That's when instead we use seated condylar position because the joints are in an adapted state. They're not in their fully natural state. They're in an adapted state. And um, most of the time, the, the condyles are not completely centered in the fossa. And where, where they're where they're theoretically supposed to be, so I, I I shy away from the expression CR just because it's not a clinical happening. Um, so I always use seated condylar position now, and sometimes seated condylar position happens to be CR just because that specific patient has both discs in place. But I've seen like one or two of these patients in the past ten years. I mean, they're rare. So, um, seated condylar position, which means the seated condyle, and the CO should correspond to MI. And that's when you get this mechanical effect I've been talking about. The, the same doctor just filled in another question. It says, seated condylar position, uh, colon, most anterior superior condylar position, question mark? Um, okay, uh, we used to define CR as the most superior position 
with anterior contact on the disc. Now, that is a physio there's a physiologic reason for calling it that way, because the, 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 the muscles, if you've looked, I, I, like again, this is a short presentation. When I do the longer, uh, the, I have a presentation that lasts for three hours. When I do the three hour presentation, then I show cadaver cuts of the disc and the condyle when they're normal, reducing, non-reducing, and totally osteoarthritic. And those images really put something in your mind. Um, so basically, the condyle has to be in the most superior position. When all the muscles start tensing up and you're clenching and chewing, you have a vertical vector of force on the condyle and you have a down and forward vector of force on the condyle coming from the lateral pterygoid. Now, when you have all of that at the same time, you have an anterior contact of the disc. And that's when the most pressure happens. Now, that's why the disc is thin in the middle. And the disc being thin in the middle, that's an, it's in the, that's in the anterior part of the condyle. Without a proper drawing here, it's hard to explain just with words. But basically, you should have your condyle in the most superior seated position and because of the because if you take the vector of forces, the vectors of force of the masseter, medial pterygoid, and temporalis, you will be vertical with a slight anterior vector to that. So you have a superior seating of the condyle with a slight anterior contact. That's how the muscles work. And that's if you just let the muscles do their job. That's how they'll seat the condyle. And if you look at a normal disc position, that's how the disc is shaped too. So that, so yes, it's a superior contact. There's a superior force applied, but there's also a slight anterior vector to that force. And uh, so that you should have superior seating with anterior contact. And that's how the condyle seat when the muscles are left alone, the, the elevator muscles are left alone to do their job. Hope that cleared that up. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I've got about four or five left here. This says, uh, do you only equilibrate to the patient's current VDO at maximum intercuspation? Sometimes I notice the anterior teeth don't touch when I equilibrate to the patient's current VDO on casts, or do you decrease VDO to achieve contact on all teeth? Thank you, great lecture. Oh, uh, well, thank you. And that was, a, that was a very good question. I have a tendency to minimize the amount I will shave off the teeth. So I don't want to equilibrate past uh, the original video. I will, I will have a tendency to use composite resin on the canines to build up the lingual aspect of the upper canines to create a canine contact and give lateral disclusion on that. Uh, so typically, uh, typically I would not go past the original vertical dimension of occlusion of the patient. So typically I prefer to slightly build that because yes, I'd say about 80% of the time that I equilibrate, there is a slight opening in the front teeth, there's a slight um, open bite in the front, and I will use a little bit of composite resin to add to the canines to make sure that those teeth are in contact. Now, if the incisors are, are out of contact of a quarter or a half a millimeter, um, I won't usually put composite resin on them. Uh, I could, maybe I should, but typically I don't do it. And the patients, I mean, I've been doing this again for 25 years, I'm equilibrated in that fashion and I'm fine and things are great. Uh, so um, uh, that's how I do it. I, I, I won't typically grind the teeth down to get to the anterior tooth contact. I, I prefer to rebuild, to build up a little bit with composite resin. It takes about two or three minutes. It's done and it, it's just a quick procedure. You know, the same uh, dentist just asked uh, also for patients with condylar degeneration, what is your time frame on the follow-up to ensure occlusion is stable? Oh, uh, about a year. 
And the patients are instructed, actually, what I do is that I, I keep their files open forever. Um, they, they, they're my, once they're my patients, we're sort of married for life. Um, they can come back after five years, 10 years, I will have their files, I will have their models, and I will make sure that I know who that patient is, was, and I, I'll have the records. Um, typically patients are instructed when they leave, I'll, I'll follow them for usually about a year, year and a half, sometimes two years. And after that, they're instructed to come back if they feel any, any, any type of change. You feel any change on your splint, you feel any change in your bite, you come back and we will take care of you. Okay. Um, uh, someone else asked, do you fabricate the splints on the maxilla, the mandible, or what, depending on the case, uh, what decides it? Okay, there, there are seven criteria I have to decide upper or lower. Uh, that comes in the, in the full-blown course. Um, they're a little long to explain, but I have seven different criteria to evaluate if I'm going to do an upper and lower splint upper or lower splint or upper and lower splint because sometimes I do a double nine guard. Um, basically, if I can, if I, I'll, I'll do, I'll sort of sum this up in a minute saying that if you have a class two patient with a strong retrognathic mandible, go for the upper. If you have a patient that can move their lower jaw past the upper incisors, if the lower incisors can go past the upper incisors, more than two or three millimeters, I will go with a lower splint. Well, that's easy. Okay. Um, do you prescribe muscle exercises, physiotherapy, when you prescribe a bite splint? And also, is the occlusal surface of the splint uh, non engaging, flat? It, uh, it, uh, yes, it is absolutely flat. The whole, my splints are totally flat. I don't even have a ramp, there's no disclusion ramp in the front. It, uh, you don't need it. Um, uh, the splints are totally flat. Uh, they're parallel to the, to the occlusal plane. The front, the front is flat. The back is flat. There's no indentations whatsoever. Uh, now I, I, I've answered the second part. What was the first part of that? The first one, do you describe muscle exercises? Yes. Yes. Most of the time, uh, I will. I, in my patients, I get about a thousand referrals a year. Um, I'd say about half and half uh, or 60, 40, I will do 60, 60% I'll, 60 I'll do splints, 40% I'll go direct to the equilibration. Um, in most cases, I'll use the splint first for six to eight months, maybe a year. I, I confirm stability for at least six months before I go to the mouth and equilibrate. So um, uh, I will, uh, most of the cases that I use splints on are cases that come in with a lot of muscle tension. Often the neck is the neck is stiff, and they just have a lot of problems. So uh, I most of the time they're sent to the physiotherapist. I'll I'll make a, a short prescription to the physiotherapist. I'll leave the physiotherapist decide what they want to do. Uh, but I will basically say I want mobility in the neck. I want mobility of the mandible. I want the muscles to be relaxed. Um, and if the patient needs uh, posture rehabilitation, take care of the posture too. Uh, so I, 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 at least 80 to 85% of the patients I make splints to also get physiotherapy. Yes. Okay. And Dr. Obey, there's one more question, which is really a request. But before I, I uh, ask that of you, I just want to let you know there's a whole bunch of other thank yous and kudos and great presentations in here. So I just want to let you know that I'm just skipping over them because obviously they're not. Oh, thank you. Thank but you very much. It was a pleasure. It was well appreciated. Uh, the last thing is actually request. And uh, one of our dentists here said, can we see a completed splint seated? Do you have a, a slide of a seated splint? Um, uh, uh, okay, where? Uh, the, 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 the question is not if, it's where, it, where is it? Um, I wasn't prepared for that this morning, so wait a minute. Can you give me a minute? I can. Okay, so if, if we're not overdue on time here, let me okay. actually, actually, if I'm correct, I have a short video of one. 
uh, which is which needs uh, where that okay let let me let me do this which which one is this okay let me do this and uh, would the person accept an animation except of something live i have an animation where we show exactly what needs to be done is that acceptable to the person that asked for that i have both i have a video of a real live delivery of a splint which lasts two three minutes or i have an animation that i can explain that explains it all at the same time Uh, we're waiting for a response. Live would be better, is what he said. Live saying. would be better? Okay, so let's take a second and do both. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I, I, I like to give as much as I can. So sure. wait, let's go to the lecture mode and let's stop this. Okay. Now, basically, you want... Uh, can, can you see that can you see this is a flat plane flat plane splint there's no yes. disclusion ramp in the front as the condyle let's do it the other way let's come seat it okay now as this patient slides forward you can see the condyle coming down and that discludes the back teeth you do not need a disclusion ramp in the front in 90 percent 95 99 percent of the cases if the curve of speed is way too high then sometimes you need a disclusion ramp in the front. But most of the time, you do not need one. So basically, I want all the teeth to touch. When the condyle seats, I want all the teeth to touch. From there, going forward, only the incisors will glide. And going sideways, only the canines will glide. So that's how splints are adjusted. Okay? so. That was the animation. Let's go to the mouth. So you should understand what I'm pointing to now. And hopefully I'll be able to find the, I'll have to start them to find out if it's the right one. I'm not sure they're not. No, this is the bite technique. Wait a minute. Is this the? No, this is the leaf gauge. Where, where is it? OK, maybe here. Okay, here it is. Got it. All right. Thank you for being patient. Okay, so let's let's go to the live mode so I can start this and stop this one. Over. Oh, you guys have the sound? Yes. Okay, you'll hear me speaking in French because this is a French. This was made in French, but basically I'll sort of override that and. First of all, you check that the splint is stable, and then I'll have the patient retrude and clench. Retrude and clench. And when they clench, that's a NACU film. So that's 20 microns thick. And I want that to just slide out very gently. I want, I want to feel a little bit of pressure, but I want it to slide out. I don't want that paper to tear. Not on the posteriors. I want, there's a little bit too much pressure right there on the bicuspid. So I'll go to the other side and I will adjust the other side. Well, I mean, it, comes, it came back from the lab and it was pretty well adjusted already. The lab, does, the lab did a great job on this one. So again, close and retrude and clench. And then you can just feel the paper, just a little bit of resistance, but there's no, there's no tugging. So a little high spot there. Okay, so let's grind that down a little bit. And you can see me grinding those down a little bit. I'll just go through, go through that quickly because we're short with time. And again, the same. It slides a little point there. We'll grind that down a little bit. And then it goes free. And we go to the other side. Oh, a little bit of tugging there. So again, I'll go back to the other side and just very, very gently polish that a little bit. And then when it slides freely, then I come to the front. I'll look at the bicuspid, and then I come to the front. And I'll check the incisors, retrude and clench. And again, free on the incisors, but the canine would tear. So I want a stronger contact on the canine. The canine bites deep and bites hard. And my most important contact is on the canine. And if you go laterally, you will see just one line 
on the canine and nothing on the posterior teeth. So one beautiful line right there, nothing in the back. And if you go to the other side, you'll have exactly the same thing. And go laterally, and you'll have that canine Marco line, and there's nothing in the back. That is beautiful. That's how you want things, a nice straight line. And going forward and back, you want at least one incisor on each side of that midline. And there you go. You got a fully adjusted splint. At least one incisor on either side, canine guidance, no excessive pressure in the back. So let me get out of this. All right. All right. And now the, the, the same uh, gentleman said, is there a specific amount that the bite is opened? Um, the least the least amount possible. Um, because I want a flat plane in the front, I want two millimeters of interincisal vertical distance. So, uh, or, or opening. I want at least to have one and a half millimeter thickness of my splint, my finished splint in the back. And I want two millimeters of vertical interincisal space so that we can build a flat plane in the front that's at least two millimeters thick. So I open the bite to the minimum possible amount. Okay, I uh, I have just one comment uh, that came in. There's a lot of more kudos. This one wraps it up. He says, "Fantastic, concise webinar. Thank you." So, I will uh, add my thank you to that. I think that was this was a, a fantastic webinar, and I see uh, the vast majority of people stayed with us throughout. So I thank them for doing that, and uh, thank you again, Dr. Obey, for uh, for just a great presentation. Well, thank you all for listening, and it, it was my pleasure to, to be here with you, and it's my pleasure to do something for you guys. Uh, I mean, you guys have been working with me for for over 10 years, and uh, you guys have been helpful and grateful, so it's just a pleasure for me to be able to give a little bit of something back. It's our um, pleasure. Our pleasure. Okay, we're good. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, just watch for more Whitmix webinars. We have lots of them lined up. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you on a, a future web, webinar. Okay, thanks again. We'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.